We're going to talk about section 3.5 TCP, which is a connection-oriented transport protocol. We're going to see in this section how a TCP actually implements the principles of reliable data transfer to provide that for the real world, for the Internet. And we're going to look at TCP in terms of its segment structure, how it does reliable data transfer, how it does flow control, and how it does connection management. Let's jump into this. Let's look at some of the key characteristics of TCP. Number one, it's a unicast protocol. Unicast means that there's one sender and one receiver. This is as opposed to multicast where there's one sender and multiple receivers. TCP has one-to-one -one communication. TCP re provides reliable in-order byte stream. That is, it provides reliability in delivering messages and it provides this abstraction of a stream of bytes that are being sent from sender to receiver um, and vice versa. There are no message boundaries. It's just a stream of bytes that can flow in either direction. Thirdly, TCP is connection oriented. That means that there's a handshaking setup process that has to happen before TCP can actually start communicating. There's an initialization of state variables and buffers and, um, and other overhead that's associated with, connect, uh, with setting up a connection. Fourthly, TCP is pipeline. And pipeline, as you recall, means that there are more than one unacknowledged segment out at once. So we, there's a window size and multiple segments can be sent out before their acknowledgments are received back. This gives us a lot better utilization of the network. TCP, as I implied, is also a full duplex protocol. This means that there's a bi-directional data flow over the same connection. So information can flow from the sender to the receiver and from the receiver to the sender. Both can send back and forth very, very easily. TCP is flow controlled. That means that the sender will limit its sending speed to make sure that the receiver will not be overwhelmed. A similar um, idea, but very different, is congestion control. And TCP also provides this. Congestion control means that the sender will limit its sending speed based on network conditions. So if the network is congested, it will slow itself down to allow the network to catch up and reduce congestion in the, in the whole network system. All right, let's see how TCP does this. How does TCP re provide reliability? TCP uses sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers in order to provide this. The sequence numbers number the bytes in the segment's data. This is a key distinction. The sequence numbers represent the byte that has been sent. So in this example, you see that this sequence number 42 represents that we're sending byte 42. The acknowledgement number is also acknowledging the last segment that it received in terms of the byte. So, for example, if a user types C on host A, that's sent with sequence number 42, acknowledgement number 79. Host B receives A, and it sends back an A. Let's say this is the protocol that we're implementing over this host A and B. When it sends back this one piece of data, it's going to increase the acknowledgement number to be 43. In this case, host B's acknowledgement number is the same, uh, is connected to the sequence number from host A. So essentially, the sequence number and acknowledgement number get swapped back and forth depending on who's the sender and who's the receiver in this full duplex communication. So because it has received this one additional byte, the letter C, it increases the sequence number by one and uses that as the acknowledgement number when host B sends back this acknowledgement. You can see that its sequence number is what host A's acknowledgement number was, 79. Host A is then going to acknowledge the receipt of this 
C that was sent back by sending back an acknowledgement that has an act number of 80, sequence number of 43. It's still 43 because no data was actually sent in this. It's just sending an acknowledgement. How does the receiver handle out-of-order segments? We've seen how TCP uses sequence numbers to number the byte that's in the stream. It uses acknowledgments as the sequence number of the next byte that's expected from the other side. And this is actually a cumulative acknowledgement. But how does the receiver handle out-of-order segments? What if the receiver receives a segment that's ahead of where it's expecting to receive? And the answer is TCP doesn't specify this. It's up to the implementer of the protocol to define that. Either the out-of-order segment is immediately discarded when it's received. This is sort of like our discussion of go back in. Or the receiver could buffer the out-of-order segment and wait for the gaps to be filled in later. That's going to require more buffer space, but uh, may be more efficient with the bandwidth. And I think most TCP implementations choose to do it this way because it is uh, more efficient in terms of communication, although it does take up some memory. So just to sum up one more time, the, the, the real trick here, um, the key trick that TCP is using, the acknowledgement number that host A puts in its segment, this acknowledgement number, is the sequence number of the next byte that host A is expecting from host B. Um, so what we're doing here is actually using a, a sequence number and an acknowledgement number which represent sort of similar things to both sides of the communication depending on who is talking to whom the sequence number and acknowledgement numbers will be swapped. Let's talk a little bit about TCP round trip time and the timeout. The question that we might ask is how long should we set the TCP timeout value? You recall we need timeouts to recover from lost packets. So how should we set the TCP timeout value? We need to set it so that it's a, it's a good estimate of the actual round trip time. What happens if the round trip time, that is the timeout value, our estimate, is too long? If the timeout value is too long, then we will be wasting a lot of time when packets are lost because we won't resend the packet until much, much after the packet was actually lost. What happens if the round trip time is too short? Well, that's also a problem because that premature timeout will cause unnecessary retransmissions. We'll retransmit the packet when we didn't really need to, when it was still going to be successfully delivered. So if it's too short, we have a premature timeout and unnecessary retransmissions. If it's too long, we have a very slow reaction to segment loss. So the moral of the story is we need to get it just right or we're going to be wasting something. We're going to be wasting time or we're going to be wasting bandwidth. Well, how do we set it just right? Well, what if we could estimate the round trip time? If we could estimate it and know what it's been in the past, maybe that would be a good guess of what it's going to be in the future. So how can we estimate the round trip time? We're going to do so using two quantities. We're going to use the sample round trip time, which is just the measured time from segment transmission until an acknowledgement is received. We're going to ignore retransmissions just looking at what is the actual round trip time between sending a segment and receiving an acknowledgement for that segment. This sample round trip time, of course, is going to vary. It may be different based on network conditions for different samples, different times that it happens over time. We'd like our round trip time estimate to be smoother. So if we average several of the recent measurements and not just use the, the latest sample, then we'll have a better estimate of how long our round trip time actually is. So let's look at how we could 
compute the average round trip time. What we're going to use is a formula that uses the exponential, exponential weighted moving average. The idea is we're going to average the current round trip time, the current sample, with an, the past averages. But we're going to give more weight to newer samples because that's closer in time and therefore probably a more accurate representation of network conditions. Here's the formula and let's think about this. So we're saying that the estimated round trip time is the sum, the weighted sum, of the previous estimate and the current sample round trip time. Notice that we use alpha here and one minus alpha. Um, alpha is going to be a number that we choose between 0 and 1, so that will make sure that these two numbers added together will always um, be 100%, essentially. A typical value of alpha is something like 0.125, you can think about that as 12.5%. So in that case, we're going to put 12.5% of our weight in this exponentially weighted moving average. 12.5% of the weight is on the most recent sample, and the other 87.5% are on the previous average that we computed the previous time. What this does is it makes the influence of past samples decrease exponentially fast. And here's a diagram that sort of illustrates this idea that as the in blue we have the actual round trip time that was sampled and you can see how much it varies. But by using this formula we can smooth out those variations and get an estimated round trip time that is based on previous data but isn't unduly weighted. Um, we don't listen too much to the huge um, spikes here and let that give us a, a bad estimate for our round trip time. Okay, so what are we going to set our time out to? We're definitely going to use this estimated round trip time to set the time out. But really for best performance, in order to be safe, we need to add a little safety margin to that. So the idea is our timeout is going to be the estimated round trip time that we've made using that previous formula plus a little safety margin. What's the safety margin going to be? The safety margin is going to be based on the estimated deviation of the sample round trip time. So how can we accurately estimate this safety margin? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, similar to the way we did before, compute an exponential moving weighted average. And we're going to do so based on the current, the, the error that we're making in the sample round trip time versus our estimated round trip time. And we're going to average that into our rolling estimate. Here's the formula we're going to use. Notice what this weighted average is. It's a weight between our running estimate of the deviation of the round trip time and our current error. That is the difference between the sample round trip time and our estimated round trip time. We're taking the absolute value of it, so it's always positive. We're multiplying those two factors by beta and 1 minus beta. Again, beta is a number between 0 and 1. Typically, 0.25. So essentially we're saying 75% of the weight of this average is our previous estimate and 25% is our current error. By doing this, we are saying that if there's greater variation in round trip times, then we should increase the timeout interval. And if there's less variation, then there should be a, a smaller amount of of deviation. Basically we don't trust our average very much if we have a lot of variation so we're going to add a greater safety margin on. What are we going to set our timeout interval to? Well the timeout interval in TCP is the estimated round trip time based on the formula that we went through earlier using the alphas plus four times this deviation of the round trip 
based on this formula here with the betas. So by taking four times the deviation of the round trip times, that's our safety margin, adding that on to our running average of the estimated round trip time, that's going to be our timeout interval for each packet. Okay, so we've looked at some aspects of reliable data transfer. Let's look at a few more. TCP runs on top of IP, which is an unreliable service. That means that IP may lose, reorder, or duplicate packets. TCP has to send its segments over IP, this unreliable service. How's it going to send it reliably? It's going to use the ingredients that we talked about in the previous section for reliable data transfer, those principles. We're going to use, in TCP, we're going to use pipeline segments. That means multiple segments can be out at once. Secondly, TCP uses cumulative acts. You recall that go back in uses the same mechanism. Our acknowledgments are saying, I have received every packet up to and including this, not individual acknowledgments. Thirdly, TCP uses a single retransmission timer. That means it's just going to remember the oldest, outstanding, unacknowledged packet and have a timer for it. It's not going to have a timer for every single out, uh, unacknowledged packet. Trans retransmissions in TCP are going to be triggered by two events. We're going to retransmit when timeouts happen and when duplicate acknowledgments are received. We'll talk more about each of these in just a moment. The TCP sender basically responds, it takes action at three events. The first event is when data is received from the application layer above it. The second event is when a timer expires, that is a timeout happens, at the TCP sender. And thirdly, when an acknowledgement is received from the receiver. At each of these three events, the TCP sender has to take some action. Let's look at each one individually. Number one, what does the TCP sender do when data is received from the application layer? Well, this is what it's going to do. It's going to create a segment with the appropriate sequence number. TCP is going to number the bytes in the byte stream between sender and receiver. So this sequence number is numbering the bytes. That's really important to remember. Secondly, TCP is going to start a timer if it's not already running. It will start a timer for the oldest unacknowledged segment and that expiration interval on the timer is the timeout interval that's been computed using the formulas that we just developed using estimated round trip time and the deviation on that estimate. The second event at a TCP sender is timeout. When a timeout happens, when one of those timers fires. When this happens, we will the TCP sender will retransmit the segment that caused the timeout because it's assuming that that segment has been lost. It will then restart the timer since this is still the oldest unacknowledged segment um, to make sure that it isn't lost again. The third event that TCP senders have to respond to is the acknowledgement received event. What happens here? Well, if this acknowledgement is for a previously unacknowledged segment, then the TCP sender has to update in its memory what packets are known to be acknowledged. If there are still outstanding segments, then we need to start a timer for them. Let's look at these three events and the actions taken at each event again in terms of pseudocode. Maybe this speaks to you. Uh, maybe this is a little bit easier for you to understand. All right, so this is pseudocode that describes how a TCP sender works. A simplified TCP sender. We'll correct this in a few slides. We have a few initialization steps. You see the next sequence number is set to some initial sequence number, which is going to be randomly computed and shared between the sender and receiver in the connection establishment phase of TCP. Um, we're also going to set this variable send base to be the initial sequence number. All right. The body of this 
algorithm is in this loop that repeats forever and this is what the loop does forever it's going to basically run a switch statement on the event that's happened and the three events that we've mentioned are the three events that are here the first event is when data is received from the application layer what's TCP do in that event in that case it will create a TCP segment with the appropriate sequence number if the timer is not currently running it will start one it's going to pass the segment to IP that's the layer underneath it to send it over the network and lastly it's going to update the sequence number and increment it increase it by the length of the data again remember that TCP is numbering the bytes in the data stream so that's one event the second event is if a timer expires if there's a timeout in that case TCP will retransmit any not yet acknowledged segment the not the oldest not yet acknowledged segment <clears throat> that's the one with the smallest sequence number and then it will restart a timer for that segment the third event is when an acknowledgement is received when that acknowledgement is received it's going to have this value we're going to call it y that is the acknowledgement number we're going to compare y to send base and if y is greater than send base we're going to update send base to be y basically this is saying did I receive a packet that's in my window that I'm expecting to receive acknowledgements for? If there are currently not yet acknowledged segments, then we need to start a timer for those. So this is the, the third event there. What do we do when an acknowledgement is received? We're going to update the segment that we're expecting to receive. And let's take a look at this visually as well. This diagram illustrates what happens when an acknowledgement is lost. So TCP is going to send, the TCP sender is going to be host A and the receiver is going to be host B in this scenario. Host A sends a packet with sequence number 92 that's eight bytes long. It's received by host B and it sends back an acknowledgement. Notice this acknowledgement is numbered 100 and that's acknowledgement number 100 because it's 92 plus 8. That's the last, um, that's the next packet sequence number it's expecting. Acknowledgement number 100 is lost. So after a timeout happens here, the sender resends sequence uh, packet number 92. It's received again, and this acknowledgement for packet 100 is sent again. Notice what the sender does is update send base from 92. 100 when this acknowledgement is received. This is what TCP does when an acknowledgement is lost. Let's see what happens if the timeout happens prematurely. In this scenario, the sender sends packet number 92 with 8 bytes and also packet number 100 with 20 bytes. As soon as host B gets this packet number 92, he sends back an acknowledgement for 100, 92 plus 8. After he receives packet 100 of 20 bytes, he increases that 100 to 120 because that's the next sequence number he's expecting to receive. Notice what happens over here at the center though. This timeout is set too short for either of these acknowledgements to be received, even the first one. So because of that, when this timeout happens, packet number 92 is resent. So that 92 with 8 bytes is resent. The sender has incorrectly inferred that the packet was lost, so it's sending it again. Actually, the timeout was just too short. You see what the receiver does in response to that. It resends the acknowledgement, not for packet 100, but for packet 120. It's saying, I have received all packets up to packet or byte 120. Um, and you see here the send basis has already been updated to 120 after it receives acknowledgement for the first 120, which is just a little bit after that timeout. So this is how TCP handles the premature timeout scenario. Let's see another scenario where, where the TCP cumulative act comes into play. In this scenario, host A again sends sequence number 92, an 8-byte packet segment, the host B. 
Post B sends back an acknowledgement for 100, which is lost. You see, very soon after this, Post A sends a, a packet with sequence number 100. That's 20 bytes. Notice it's the receiver will then acknowledge that it's received all the packets up to um, now it's expecting byte 120. So acknowledgement 120 is sent back. The timeout would happen here. Notice since it receives a packet, an acknowledgement with number 120, it updates send base to 120, and the sender knows that the receiver has received everything up to 120, even though it never got back that packet for 100 uh, because TCP is sending a cumulative acknowledgement. Um, because it's received this 120, it knows that it must have just lost this other one uh, because we've advanced all the way to 120. These show us some of the behaviors of TCP senders and receivers. Now, this table is rather complex. It has a lot of information in it, and it explains how acknowledgments are generated at the receiver. So this is the way to read this table. These are the events that happen at the receiver in this first column. The second column explains what action the receiver takes based on each of those events. Um, so the events in the left column have to do with if segments arrive in order or out of order and if they are, um, if those packets are expected or if there's still an act pending, if there's a gap or if there's not a gap. And you can read through this and, and it makes sense what TCP would do in all these different scenarios, um, but it is a little complex. Let's look at a problem that exists, sort of an inefficiency in the part of the TCP we presented and see if we can identify a solution. Look at this scenario. Host A is sending to host B. Notice it's sending five packets, so it looks like the window size is at least five. Packet number one is sent, but packet number two is lost. Packet three, four, and five are also sent. Notice that after packet one is received, an acknowledgement is sent for packet one. That's good. Furthermore, also note that three other acknowledgements for packet one are received by the sender. What should the sender, host A, infer after receiving multiple acknowledgements for the same packet? What can host A understand about the situation? What might he infer? We can see the whole scenario, so we understand what's going on. But what the sender can also guess in this case and infer is that Packet number two is lost, but notice it's action. It doesn't do anything because packet loss is detected by timeout in the version of TCP we presented earlier. So that means that the host A, even though it's received these three duplicate acknowledgements, it's going to wait until this time period here at the green before it resends packet number two, which is sort of a waste. What, what might we do differently to handle the situation better? Well, TCP solves this with an algorithm called fast retransmit. The problem, as we've said, is that the timeout period is too long. And often, we receive back these multiple duplicate acknowledgments much before the timeout would expire. So the solution that TCP presents is to use duplicate acknowledgments to detect lost segments. This way we avoid the relatively long timeout period before resending a lost packet. Fast retransmit works in the following way. If three acknowledgments are received, three duplicate acknowledgments after the first real one are received, it will assume the worst that this packet has been lost and will immediately resend the segment even before the timer expires. Essentially, if the sender receives three acknowledgments for the same data, 
it assumes that the segment after the acknowledged data was lost. Um, essentially, it sees those three duplicate acts as a negative acknowledgement and resends the lost packet immediately. This is what this looks like visually. So after three duplicate acts are received at this point, the sender will resend packet number two immediately and not wait for the timeout. So if we were going, we should, if we tweak and correct our pseudocode, you notice that um, at this third event, we're going to add on an else block where the else block checks for duplicate acts, um, keeps a count of them, and if that count is three, then we will resend the segment with that sequence number that's missing. So this is the pseudocode that implements that fast retransmit algorithm. Next, let's talk about flow control. What is flow control? Um, flow control is about packets, and it's about preventing a fast sender from overwhelming a slow receiver. Really, flow control is about matching the speed of the sender to the speed of the receiver. TCP's flow control service is a speed matching service to make sure that the sender's rate of sending matches the receiver's rate of receiving, that is the application's ability to drain those messages away. So we just want to make sure that the sender won't overflow the receiver's buffer by transmit, transmitting too much data too fast. How does TCP do this? Well, this is how TCP implements flow control. We're going to model the buffer space as this diagram shows. And we're going to imagine that our buffer is received buffer Y. There's that many bytes of buffer space. We know that there's a certain amount of buffer space in use and a certain amount that's unused. We're going to call this unused buffer space the receive window. This is the window that the receiver has that it can continue to store data in as it's being read out. Mathematically, we can define it as listed here. If you look in the brackets first, we're going to take the last byte received, that number, minus the last byte read. That The difference of those two is basically the width of this purple area, how much TCP data is in the buffer. If we subtract that from the size of the receive buffer, we'll get the width of the receive window. Okay, so we can mathematically, uh, based on the state of TCP, the TCP receiver, keep track of how much space is in the receive window, how much buffer space is empty. What do we do with that? Well, we just need to tell the sender how much space we have and make sure that he doesn't send any more than that. On the receiver side, the receiver will simply send our window to the sender, and it can do this in every packet as, um, as part of the protocol. So every acknowledgement will contain the size of the receive window. The sender will limit the number of unacknowledged bytes to the size of the receive window. So that way it will never send more than the receiver has capacity to receive. So this is a pretty simple but elegant solution to the problem that guarantees that the receiver's buffer doesn't overflow. Um, essentially the receiver is advertising how much buffer space it has available by including that value in the segment header that it's sending to the sender. This is TCP flow control. As we conclude, I want to say a few words about connection management, which is this is how connections are established and torn down in TCP. Remember that TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, meaning that the sender and receiver have to establish a connection before they can exchange actual data. Why do they have to do this? Well, we can begin to see, since we know how TCP works, that there are some variables that need to be initialized and buffer space that needs to be set up um, for flow control and other things. We've got to pick our sequence numbers. 
So these variables have to be set up. The receive window has to be identified and shared um, and before we can begin. And in the scenarios that we're going to look at, we can imagine the, the client as the initiator of the connection and the server is the system that's contacted by the client. Now we know once the connection is, is established, the TCP is full duplex and information can flow in either direction. To start off with, TCP uses a three-way handshake. In a three-way handshake, uh, it looks something like this. The client is going to send a TCP send packet to the server. This specifies the initial sequence number. It doesn't contain any data. In response to that, the server will send back a SYNAC packet. The server allocates buffers. It specifies the initial sequence number, but this packet also contains no data. This is These first two parts of the three-way handshake are just for setting up the connection. The third piece is this acknowledgement, which is the, the client saying, I'm accepting your connection and starting this TCP connection. Um, this acknowledgement packet may contain data. And then more packets will be exchanged back and forth after this. This is the same process described in words in this three-way handshake with the SYN, SYNAC, and ACK packet. The book describes an interesting way to exploit the behavior of TCP, and this is an old attack called the sin flood attack. The idea is that it's possible to overwhelm a receiver, a server, with just a flood of sin packets to create these halfway open connections where each of these connections, each of the received sin packets, causes the server to actually allocate resources and therefore deplete its own resources by opening all these bogus half-open connections. The book also explains a very elegant solution involving SYN cookies that prevents the server from allocating resources until the acknowledgement, that third step, is received. So there's, it, it confirms that there really is a client out there. How is a TCP connection closed? Well, it's a four-step process. The key is that the client and the server both have to understand that the connection is completely closed. And that's why it takes so many steps. So step number one, there's a special kind of packet called a fin or finished packet that's sent. The server will respond back to that with an ACK. Um, it will close the connection and then send a fin packet itself. Um, that's the third step. When, the, when that acknowledgement is received, it will be, it will re then receive the fin packet and send back an act packet, the, the client will. And at this point, the connection is closed on both sides. So there is um, a little bit of nuance, a uh, little subtleties here to make sure that both sides understand that this connection is closing um, and is closed. So after this timed wait, the client has the connection closed, and after this acknowledgement is received at the server, the connection is closed. So this is how TCP connection is closed. Let's take a few more moments to examine the structure of a TCP segment. So this is how a TCP segment is actually structured. These are the fields and their sizes uh, that are used to define and implement the protocol that we've looked at already. Notice these important elements of a TCP segment. First, we have the source port and destination port, both 16-bit numbers. Secondly, we have a sequence number and acknowledgement number. Both of these are 32-bit numbers. We've seen how important these are in TCP. They count the byte stream of the data. Again, these don't count segments, but the byte stream. And these are really important in helping the sender and receiver communicate about what packet they've last received or sending. 
Another important field here is the receive window. Uh, when we talked about this, this is how TCP implements flow control. So this is how much buffer space the receiver has and how many bytes it's willing to accept. The checksum is the internet checksum that we've talked about before. Uh, it's a 16-bit number that checks 4-bit errors. Down here you see the bulk of this segment is the application data that it's encapsulating. A couple more things to take note of here. There are several features of TCP that are no longer utilized or never really took off. The urgent data field, the push data now, aren't really used. You do see here though this RST, the SIN, the, SIN, the FIN, these connection establishment packets um, are made so by marking these flags as a one instead of a zero. So these one bits, uh, these one bit fields define packets to be of a certain type. So what we've seen is TCP is an important protocol for providing reliable data transfer. And it does so using the principles that we talked about in the previous section, those being it's a pipeline protocol that utilizes checksum and retransmission, sequence numbers, acknowledgement numbers, and these things are used in TCP um, in a very well-designed way to provide reliable data transfer. TCP also provides flow control and it, it therefore prevents the receiver from being overwhelmed by the sender. We've seen that TCP is a connection-oriented service, meaning that we have to set up a connection to start and we have to tear it down when we're done, and we've seen the protocols used for that. TCP is one of the backbone protocols of the internet. It's one of the most important protocols that make the internet work for us. So it's important to understand and appreciate how it does its job of reliable data transfer.